This morning, we're going to turn and do some work in Luke 23. So if you have a Bible, turn it. We're going to uh, look at this whole chapter, and it's 56 verses long. So that means that you um, are going to fast this afternoon. And, <laughs> but really, we're going to actually just zoom in on a particular passage in the, in the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. And as we kind of prepare our hearts for that, this is a heavy passage. There's no way to, like as we step into the text, to make light of what's going on here, nor should we. And so I hope that for the next 25, 30 minutes, that together we can gaze at the crucified Jesus and that we can look afresh at what he's done for us, that we could see ourselves in the story too and how we respond to Jesus. And as we step into our text today, um, before we do that, I, I thought it would be helpful to talk about Mike Tyson. And Mike Tyson's known to have this quote that uh, if you may have heard it before. He says, everyone has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. And, you know, when you think about boxing, you go, and go in with your plan, you know your opponent, and, and it goes well until you get that first punch in the face, and then you have to adjust footing, and life has a way of doing the same thing, right? We wake up each day, we have a plan for how the day is gonna go, at least I do. I, I, I'm an idealist sometimes, much to my own dismay, where I think like, here's the day, here's how it's gonna work out. But as you know, rarely does a day work out exactly as you have in mind. You wake up in the morning, you might have just didn't sleep well the night before, or your kid wakes up and they have a fever and all of a sudden your plans for work change. Or your boss calls an extra meeting when you've already had a day full of meetings. Or your teacher gives you more homework. Life has a way of throwing punches at us. And life has a way of throwing punches at us in more than just like the, the day-to-day schedule changes. Sometimes life has a way of made, throwing major curveballs at us. Uh, sicknesses, hardships financial hardships, so on. In, in those moments, I don't know about you, but in those moments when life throws hard things at us, when things are, are difficult, when whatever the plans change, it has a way of kind of bringing out what's inside of us. And I don't know if, if you experience the same thing, but I don't do super well with major schedule adjustments um, that are outside of my control. I like to be... Um, the captain of my schedule, which is, uh, can be difficult sometimes. So when, so when a major change comes or a curveball comes, sometimes my reaction can be anger. Sometimes it can be increased anxiety because I can't control it. Sometimes I can feel my stress levels just kind of go up here and the things I really need to do kind of get pushed out and I end up doing things that I don't think are as important. And what about you? When, when life throws at you hard things, how do you respond? When life pushes you to the, to the edge of yourself, what comes out? Sometimes we really see the ugliness of our own hearts when we're kind of pushed to those things. We kind of discover that maybe we're not as reliant on God as we should be. Maybe we're not as dependent on the Holy Spirit for help in our difficult circumstances, whenever we're kind of pushed to the edge of ourselves. And last week in Elliot's really excellent sermon, if you haven't listened to it, go back. He kind of talked about, you know, kind of sicknesses in his house, kind of, kind of pushed him to a place where he needed to choose to be dependent on God. And today I want to kind of take a similar theme and I want to keep going with that. And I want us to look at Jesus and as he's pushed to the very very, very edge. What comes out of him? Because I don't know about you, but what comes out of my mouth when I'm pushed to the edge or when the driver cuts me off or whatever, it's not always blessing. Sometimes it's cursing. But when we look at Jesus, I want us to see in the crucified Christ what comes out when somebody is pushed to even to death. What comes out of the life in the mouth of Jesus? We have wonderful ways 
of dismissing how we behave when we're pushed to the edge. Sometimes, you know, when we snap at our spouse or at our kids, we say, ah, that wasn't really me. Or when we react to the, the schedule changes, ah, that wasn't really me, I was just stressed. But I think we all know that that is really us. That is really us, and what's inside of us isn't always really pretty. But we're going to discover Jesus, who when pushed to the edge, what comes out of his mouth is blessing and not cursing. It's life-giving and not life-destroying. So with that, when Jesus was pushed to the limits, when Jesus is pushed to death, there are three things, at least three things we can notice, but there are three things I want us to see from our passage today. And the first is forgiveness. Forgiveness. When Jesus is pushed to the edge, what comes out of him is forgiveness. So in our text today, it's Friday. It's what's known as Good Friday. The day of Jesus' crucifixion, and he's in the last week of his life before he was crucified. And yesterday in the text, in the text that Elliot covered last week, and in the week before that, when we looked at the Lord's Supper, it was... Thursday. And I want us to consider Jesus' day on Thursday to help us understand Friday a little bit. So on Thursday, Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples, where he told them that he, he picked up bread and he picked up wine and said, this is, this is my body broken for you and my blood shed for you. This heavy, heavy moment in it, in his life where he kind of lays this at his disciples' feet, knowing what is about to come, this is Jesus saying, talking about communion. Then his disciples, they argue amongst themselves about something that isn't relevant to the moment, but in Jesus feels the weight of what's about him, goes to the garden to pray. And while he is praying, he he feels that weight so much that his sweat, that the, like the capillaries and his blood vessels, I don't know all the, I'm not a doctor, but, but like where he just starts to sweat blood. Like, and he's, he hasn't really eaten. He's eaten maybe one meal so far that day. And he is so, so stressed about what's to come, asking the father to take the cup from him, but nevertheless submitting to the will of his father as a part of that, like being a part of the of God's plan, he, he joins in that. He sweats blood, and then after that, he's betrayed by one of his closest friends at the time, and then he's arrested. And then he's denied by Peter, just as he said, and then he's beaten, and he's mocked, and he's scorned, and he's weak, and it's just Thursday. It's not even Friday yet. So Friday comes, it's Friday morning, and Jesus is dragged before the Sanhedrin, which is where the, past, the end of chapter 22 ends. And he's dragged in front of them for claiming to be the Messiah, the deliverer. And he won't deny it, because after all, he is. The Sanhedrin, which is the religious rulers of the time, want him gone. They ship him to Pilate, which is this kind of Roman governor. He was a man in authority. He's a Roman official. And they bring up charges about him. Um, you can look up in, in verse two, they claim that he was opposed paying taxes to Caesar. And if you've been with us in Luke, you'll know that Jesus uh, told, his, told people to render under Caesar's. What is Caesar's? So the religious authority trump up charges and Pilate asked Jesus, if you have your Bible open, I hope you do. Verse three, are you the king of the Jews? And he, Jesus, just answers him, you say so. Pilate then is like, tells the chief priest, tells the crowd, I find no reason to convict this man. I find no reason to put him to death. So Pilate tries to just pawn him off on Herod, realizing that Herod, who is this other leader at the time, he ships him off to Herod. And Jesus, he's, he's weak. He's tired, he's been sweating blood, he's hungry, he's been beaten, goes off to Herod. And Herod, text says, wants to see Jesus. And 
If you have your Bible, verse 8, Herod was very glad to see Jesus. For a long time, he had wanted to see him because he had heard about him and was hoping to see some miracle performed by him. Herod doesn't really care to believe in Jesus. He just wants to see Jesus perform some trick. And Jesus won't give in to Herod's demands. He won't even answer Herod, just accepting him. And so Herod has him beaten. And so Jesus, standing there, bloodied, bruised, then he's mocked and beaten again. He's dressed in clothes, purple clothing and shipped off back to Pilate. It's Friday, still Friday morning. And Jesus, when sent back to Pilate, Pilate can't find a reason to condemn Jesus. And I would encourage you to take some time today and just reread this whole story here. And the crowd demands that Barabbas be released and that Jesus be crucified. Now, Barabbas was a terrible person. He was an insurrectionist, he was a murderer, and he was somebody that looked a lot closer to what they thought the Messiah should be than Jesus. And they demand that this lawless man be released and that this innocent man, the Christ, be crucified in spite of Pilate's admission that Jesus didn't deserve death. And they demand and they demand, and the text says the crowd's voice kind of won out. Pilate gives in, and he hands Jesus over. They send him to be crucified, call a man, Simon of Cyrene, to carry a cross behind him, and then drop your eyes to verse 32. Two others, criminals, were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. This is Jesus pushed to the very edge, hung on a cross, in the words that come out of his mouth, our Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus, when pushed to the very edge of life itself by people who did horrible things to him, mocked him, beat him, conspired against him, an innocent person, What Jesus says isn't, Father, condemn them, isn't, Father, destroy them, it's, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Most of us, when pushed to the edge, we crack. We want justice. We demand, like, things be right. We want our own way. But when Jesus gets pushed to the edge, when Jesus is is a victim, when Jesus is the sufferer among sufferers, when Jesus is there, he cries out, Father, forgive them. In most of us, when we're pushed to the edge, when our stress levels increase, when things are hard, we, we act in ways that we shouldn't. We say things that we shouldn't, or we make excuses for our behavior. There's inconsistencies in the way we live our lives. We tell our kids not to behave in ways that we then do, right? In all of these sorts of things. But when Jesus, when Jesus is crucified, what comes out of him is exactly the things that he has been teaching all along. To bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Jesus, true from start to finish. And this Jesus, friends, this Jesus in his, his offer of forgiveness is offering to do away with our guilt too. When when we come to Jesus guilty, as we know we are, as guilty as the people who crucified him that day, when we come to Jesus, he offers to take away our guilt. In his words of forgiveness, he takes away the very things that keeps us from God. This is Jesus. And if you wonder 
what, what Jesus thinks of you, after you've sinned, after you've done horrible things, after you've, after you've misused God's name, after you've, after you've mistreated your family, after whatever it is, after you've lied, after you've cut corners at work, after you've offended God, what Jesus does is he offers forgiveness, just like he offered forgiveness that day. Father, forgive them. So we see Jesus extend forgiveness, but we also see that Jesus grants acceptance. He gives acceptance. Let's read uh, verses uh, 35 to 43. If you have your Bible, the people stood watching and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription above him, this is the, was above him, this is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Scene is set. Jesus is hanging there, bloodied, beaten, crown of thorns on the cross. He's been nailed to it in a method of execution designed to give the most amount of pain possible in which your shoulders would break and you would die of suffocation. And he's hanging there, the innocent, in between two guilty criminals. He's experiencing an intense amount of discomfort and pain. And there's an inscription above the cross behind him. It says, this is the king of the Jews, which is ironic because he is the king of kings after all. And this innocent one is crucified among the lawless ones. He was counted among the lawless. One of the criminals is so miserable that he can't help but mock Jesus. If you're a king, save yourself and us. Jeers at him, pokes at him, which is pretty remarkably awful. And then the other criminal pipes up on the other side of Jesus and says, we're deserving of this. This man is innocent. Don't you fear God? And he cries out to Jesus. Jesus, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And what does Jesus do? Jesus offers forgiveness. You may have known people that have had deathbed conversions where they've kind of gone their whole life rejecting Jesus, and they've then, at the end, placed their faith in him. You you might know, I know some people like that. And this is this guy's deathbed conversion. And note that what Jesus tells the guy is like, dude, my ministry has been, isn't, dude, my ministry has been going on for three years. Why didn't you, why didn't you believe that? He doesn't tell the guy, it's a little, too little, too late. No, he offers the guy pure assurance. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus gives acceptance. There's this video floating around the internet of Alistair Begg, who's a pastor out in um, Chagrin Falls, Ohio, talking about this passage. And it's so good that um, I'm just gonna use his illustration, so this isn't mine. Uh, You can look it up later on YouTube. It's called The Man on the Middle Cross. I would encourage you to do so. He's got a great Scottish accent. It's more interesting than mine. And anyways, he talks about like this guy. This guy, he's, he's never been in a Bible study. He's never been baptized, never joined a local church. He never went through like confirmation. He, he never like read systematic theology. He never went to Sunday school, never any of it, but he made it. He made it to heaven. 
And Beg talks about, and I think it's so fun um, to think about, it's like, imagine this guy, he gets up to heaven, like he dies and just a few moments later, and he's there. How did he make it? He, he's there, he does no clue what's going on, he's never been taught anything, and an angel comes up to him and says, well, what are you doing here? And he's like, I don't know. And the angel's like, well, what do you mean you don't know? He's like, I don't know, I don't know. He's like, well, but you, what, how do you not know? Let me go get my supervisor angel. So the guy go gets his supervisor angel. Supervisor angel comes over and says, um, sir, sir, do you, do you believe in the doctrine of sola scriptura? And the guy says, I don't know what you're talking about. It's like, what about the doctrine of justification by faith alone, through grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone? It's like, guys, like I never heard of it before in my life. And the angel just stares and says, then on what basis are you here this morning? And the man responds, the man on the middle cross said I could come. And Beg points out the beauty of that statement, that that's the only answer that matters because there is this propensity to think that we can contribute something to what Jesus has already done for us, that we bring something to the table, that if I just get my beliefs in the right order, that if everything is perfect, that if my life looks a certain way, that if I do all of the right things, then, then God will accept me. But that's not the message of the gospel. We can't add anything to it. We don't, we don't get entrance into the kingdom of God by what I do, because I, because I had faith, because I believed in Jesus, because I was baptized as a kid. We get entrance, as Beg points out in the video, as, as is clear in our text today, because he died for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus offers acceptance. And so, if you're here, and you're new to this whole faith thing, Maybe you're not even, maybe you wouldn't even consider yourself a Christian. You're wondering like at what level you have to reach to be accepted. You need not look past a bloody cross where Jesus offers forgiveness to a criminal and says, today you'll be with me because Christ is enough for you. You don't have to learn enough things. Christ is enough for you. For those of you who've been following Jesus a long time, you've been, it's really easy to start looking at your spiritual resume, your CV, and say like, I'm a community group leader, I help lead worship team, I read my Bible every day, I, whatever the list of things is, I understand like infra, infra and superlapsarianism, and if you don't know what those are, don't look them up, it's a waste of your time. Um, but. But, or I, I, like, I can pull up all of my things and say, like, I'm a, I'm a pretty good Christian. But those don't count for anything in the kingdom. You don't earn God's love. Christ is enough for you. He is sufficient. And friends, it, for the lonely here, notice what Jesus offers this guy is acceptance. Jesus sees the ugliness of who he is. He's crucified next to a criminal and knows that he deserves to be there. But Jesus extends his love towards him anyways and offers to, hey, in this kingdom, by believing in me, by resting in me, you're accepted. And friends, there's not different tiers to this kingdom. We come into following Jesus together and God puts us all on equal standing and he invites us into a family. Jesus' acceptance cures our loneliness because he gives us himself and he gives us a family. Jesus, when pushed to the edge, when mocked in scorn, he offers forgiveness, he offers acceptance, and he displays submission. Verses 44 to 49 says this, it's now about noon. And darkness came over the whole land until three o'clock because the sun's light has failed. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, <clears throat> excuse me, I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. 
when the centurion saw what happened, he began to glorify God, saying, this man really was righteous. All the crowds that had gathered for the spectacle when they saw what had taken place went home, striking their chests. But all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. It's noon, midday, the time we're approaching now. And as the Son of God is crucified, the light is dim, the curtains split, and the perfect, spotless one breathes his last, and his last words are, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Jesus' last breath was a breath of deep trust in the Father. And when pushed, Jesus shows that he is the faithful servant of Israel who gives access to God and liberates us. Jesus fully entrusts his life in the darkest moment in history to the Father as he bears the sins of the world upon himself, as he offers forgiveness and acceptance, as he bears the wrath of God, he, off, he entrusts his life to God. This is often, this is different than how we, we respond. Most of the time, when, when things start going askew, we grab for the controls. We complain to God. We, we find out all the reasons God shouldn't have done something, all the reasons that we shouldn't be experiencing this. And we just, we get angry, we get upset, we get tired, whatever it might be. But Jesus, when he is pushed to the edge, perfectly entrusts his father. It's amazing. So amazing, in fact, that we see the response of the centurion. And it's really easy to kind of read past this guy because we're so familiar with the story. But I want us to think about that centurion for a minute. He would have been Roman, so he would have been a Gentile. He would have, he would have been a pretty hardened dude. He was probably the guy that physically nailed Jesus to the cross. He, was, he would have perhaps participated in multiple crucifixions that week. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe he was the guy that like the crucifixion guy. That was his job. He was like the dude we see in movies with the black hat and the, who pulls the guillotine or chops the head off or whatever. Maybe that was this guy. But he was probably the guy that literally put the, drove the nails into the hands and feet of Jesus or stuck the spear into his side. And after he hears Jesus offer forgiveness, offer acceptance to a criminal, and then entrust his life to God, the man steps back and says, truly, this one was righteousness, was righteous. The first confession of the righteousness of Jesus after his death came not from the people closest to Jesus, but from the very person that would seem furthest from Jesus. Truly, this one was righteous. Jesus was innocent. Others, other gospels say that truly this man was the son of God. And friends, when you push Jesus to the limits, when you push him to the very edge of his own life, what comes out is that he is the faithful servant who liberates us through his sacrifice. And friends, Jesus came. We know from the gospel of Luke or from other places that the thesis statement is that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He came to announce good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to the captives, to, 
to sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free. And when we get to it, Jesus does just that through his sacrifice. He offers forgiveness of sins, acceptance into his family, and freedom from ourselves so we can submit our lives and entrust our lives to the Father, the same Father that Jesus entrusted his life to. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And if you have your Bible open, I think one of the interesting things is to pull up to 30,000 feet, go back to chapter 22, and look at all of the people who are gathered around the cross that day. You have the apostles. You have a group of faithful women. You have Pilate. You have the Sanhedrin. You have the religious elite. You have the Roman elite. You would have had poor people in the crowds, you have Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross. In just after, in the passage right after this one, you'll see Joseph of Arimathea, who was part of the Sanhedrin, who didn't agree with what went down, offers to bury Jesus. You have a centurion, you have criminals. You have the highest in society and the lowest of society, and they're all kind of gathered under the foot of the cross. And so here Luke's Thesis statement that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And who are the lost? If it's not everybody. We're all kind of gathered, represented in that scene with, with wealthy and poor and high class and low class and people in the government, people, the religious types, they're all there. And the first person who submits to Jesus is a centurion who crucifies him. And I want to ask, what have you done with Jesus? Have you looked at the man on the cross who offers forgiveness to his murderers, acceptance to the far from him, and entrust his life to God? Have you looked at him and seen everything he's done for you, how much he has freed you, and how much love exists in him? He is the servant. He is the one who lived the life that we could not live. And he shows through his death that that, that that life went even into his death. And it was through his death and through his resurrection, which we'll talk about next week, that we're liberated and freed to know God. At the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, there is uh, Mary was visited by an angel and she was told, that she would bear the Messiah. And she responded with a song. And the song was from the Magnificat. Here's a section of it. In this, in this passage is fulfilled all the way back here in Luke 23. From Luke 1, Mary said, He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud. Those religious leaders, the Roman leaders, Jesus has scattered them because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. Anyone can have access to this kingdom. You think that power gives you something? It doesn't in the kingdom of God. Jesus toppled all of that and he's exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things. He set the rich Away empty, he has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. Jesus' sacrifice, the liberating king, does this. He is a fulfillment of what Mary said way back in chapter one. He is the liberator from sin, and he can liberate you from your sin. And if you've believed in him, he's offering you full forgiveness, full acceptance, and a life lived trusting in the good plan of God. And I pray that you would see and behold that risen, that crucified Christ, and think of his resurrection, that he would put your greatest enemies to rest, death itself. Would you pray with me?